All right, um, and it, funny that Julie would raise that because uh, that is one of the things to, to address. I, I can assure you we're, we're on the home stretch. I have eight slides to show you, so um, it shouldn't be that painful, hopefully not. I um, wanted to start with kind of the, the overall goal of the workshop, and the reason I'm up here as opposed to sitting back there is that I can actually edit from here where I, where I can't do that there, so, so please give us some, some revisions. Um, what we have is, is about three slides worth of, of guidances that have come up as we've discussed both last evening and, and today. Um, ignore the, the numbers that are, are shown here. I don't have a pointer, but uh, but like the six and the 15 are just for me so that I know what, what part of the discussion it came from. Um, but we had two kind of Con conflicting views. One was that we may need more finer divisions of population-specific reference populations uh, in order, I think that was particularly in, in the discussion about imputation from exome chip data to sequencing data, et cetera, um, versus the comment that came up a little bit later in the day was that if we do enough, people will have enough um, you know, we'll basically get enough reference so that everybody's genome will be covered. Did, do we have a consensus on, on this point? Are, are, are both things true and, and they're just for different purposes or what comments on that? So this was mainly, I think, sort of Maynard and um, um, Lynn perhaps. A little bit with Peter uh, in, the, in the discussion in terms of, of imputation, I think, was the, the population-specific reference samples. W would anyone argue we don't need m more fine my, my takeaway from that discussion is we need a very large sample. We need okay. a very large sample. But not really weird people? We, we don't need No, no I think it would be a very a big mistake to basically sequence Rhode Island and only sequence Rhode Island. Yeah, I'm sorry. I shouldn't. I, he, I was insulted. <laughs> he loves Rhode Island. <laughs> I think we need to have a very large sample. Then within that, we can do either either... Um, nested um, resampling or adjustment, but I, I think we run the risk if we try to design, we're, we're actually going to sample, we're going to basically exclude certain ethnic groups because we want this pure homogeneous population. I think it was Maynard that suggested, I forgot the word, you know, we're mongrels and we need to embrace that history and integrate it into the science and not run from it. Stephen? Use your microphone. Sure. I think this is a very important point, but I think it's going to be driven by the two critical decisions that take place before, that is, what disease and what cohorts or studies you're using to do this. And, you know, as, as you're looking at the sample sizes and the how good the phenotyping is and the availability of things, this would be, in my mind, a second a second tier, an assessment of, yes, we need to be sure that we have addressed this in one way or another as we try and assemble as large a sample size as possible. But I'm not sure it would be the first thing that I would think about would be the, 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 the population sampling, you know, because a lot of this is going to come down to what's really available, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and what do we actually want to study, you know, something in heart disease or something in cancer mm -hmm. or something in diabetes. And looking at that, what studies are going to have those things are going to inform us as to how we need to address these questions. Peter. I just want to remake Rory's point, which is, given that we all think diversity is important, you can do it two ways. You can either do it by, by having a large diverse sample, or you can have several different samples, each of which is homogeneous, but you cover the diver diversity across the samples. So we'll, we'll ask for both. How's that? <laughs> And so we're needed, I think, is, is probably, I think, what people are saying. You know, I'd, I'd just like to add. What about all? What do you mean all? Well, instead of a large diverse population and several, how would you, you, could have, you could do one or the other or both. Well, I, I, I guess I was hearing, really, we wanted a large diverse population. We, we really wanted large, I guess. Let's large put it is good. Large. But we didn't want Rhode Island. So, so we don't want <laughs> Wales. We, we don't want Kenya. We, we want... Diverse or not? Pardon me? Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so, so we want we want both, Peter. And so, so I guess I'm I'm lost then. Do, when you said one or the other. <laughs> I guess it is late in the day. Okay. Um, small. All right. But uh, Terry, I, yes. I I also think that even with the sequence data that we have, we could we could do some very interesting analyses and explorations to look at the effects of 
of population diversity. Oh, could you use the microphone or lean into it a little I, bit? I thought I was. <laughs> Um, I, no, I'm, I, I, I think that uh, even with the data that we have, uh, the sequence data uh, existing and that will be coming in in the next, in the next uh, well, this year, uh, we can do some, some interesting analyses that will inform us a little bit better about the effects of population differences on the distribution of rare variants and their relationship uh, even to phenotypes. Mm -hmm. So I, I, and I think that that would help to guide a strategy uh, once we just have better knowledge of, mm -hmm. of that genetic architecture. Okay. So, so probably fair enough to say this is one where the, the jury's still out. So the Supreme Court has yet to rule. Yeah, in my okay. opinion, we don't know enough yet. Yeah. Okay. Let the data speak for itself, huh. as opposed to judicial. Uh, yes, and I and I would point out these are these are not prioritized. These are temporal sequence. So and and this again is sort of guidance. This isn't how we're going to select. But these are you know one of the reasons we're here is to give NIH institutes ideas about what they should be doing in sequencing. So um, another that that uh, Chris had suggested was combining exome chip data on rare variants to improve assumptions about uh, for for power calculations and other things. Any disagreement that that is a useful thing to do and not an easy thing to do. No, it's a useful thing, but I, I think that's a secondary analysis to the sequencing. I mean, I, I wouldn't right. let that tail wag the dog of what the decisions are for sequencing. I mean, it, it's going to be a natural outgrowth of that. I fear I may have started in the wrong place. So let me start instead huh. with, <laughs> with the signing, because those were really, really were the secondary things. Those were the guidance, the, the, the advice to NIH on, on that, but that had been our, our primary goal. So let's, let's go to the scientific questions that Eric displayed previously. Um, at the beginning of the day, what I've shown here are his sort of top highest bullet level uh, questions. Then he had several sort of sub-questions. Um, what's shown in white are, the, are his top level, and then the yellow things are, are things that came up during the discussion, so in addition to what, what he had added. Um, so, so we were hearing in, in the genetic architecture, we would like to learn about the spectrum of phenotypes with given mutation. This was particularly um, evident in, in some of the Mendelian discussion that Mike and others uh, gave us, but others as, as well. Um, potential specificity of treatments with specific mutations, again, an, an example uh, uh, in Marfan's or in, uh, in CF, and identifying all the mutations in patients with a classic genotype. So they have, they have the Delta F508, but you, you want to know what else um, may be there and may actually be underlying. Are, are these somewhat along the lines of what was discussed? You're looking, you have a furrowed brow, Stephen. I, I think, do we also have, the, I think, the point that Maynard had made last night and again today about looking at phenotypes a bit differently on the basis of the genotypes, the discovery of the, the people that don't necessarily meet particular criteria of, of disease. Is that what you mean by spectrum of phenotypes with a given mutation? Yes. Okay, just want to be sure. Yes, Judy. So since I was responsible for this topic, uh, regarding your second bullet point, um, I think that uh, we talked about this more emphasized last night was this decade was devoted to the biology of discovery, and there's a lot of kind of maybe a de-emphasis today of the omics, but recognizing that's going to be an enormous challenge. And that's going to require to modernize the discovery process. We're going to, it's going to have to involve a kind of new kind of discovery teams, research teams, and realignment of incentives. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, so, so that would be in the second bullet here. Yeah. Needs, needs new discovery models, perhaps. Oh, you meant under the not one. Okay. Sorry. Okay. New discovery models, would you say, or teams? Okay, great. Um, didn't do much with pharmacogenetics. I, I, what I mean was the things that came up in the discussion were, I think were pretty much covered by what Eric had, had previously said. Yes, uh, Roy. Just a, a sort of comment on, on power calculations. I mean, I, I know power calculations can be done. And of course, they were done to justify all the GWAS studies that were done. And then they were found to be wanting. Um, and really, they are, you know, they're, they're done to justify something based on assumptions that you don't know whether they're valid. Um, and they're really driven by how much you can afford uh, rather than by any real science. And, and, and that's what I was trying to get at with this point about um, the, the next few years um, should not be on the ex based on the expectation of getting results about uh, variants for disease. Um, but learning how to use these data. 
with, with the expectation that in 10 to 15 years, when you don't have to determine the study size based on economics, but you can just do as many as you've got, um, then, uh, then you know how to analyze the data. I'm not at all sure um, that power calculations have much real value. Well, they're entirely dependent on the underlying assumptions. And, and Which have been you know, shown repeatedly over the last to be five way years too to be completely... You know, Unrealistic. Fallacious. <laughs> Tricia. Um, I think, actually, part of the reason we were talking about case cohort is a little bit of splitting the difference, and maybe... Maybe this is a case where I shouldn't argue with myself, but rather say that in a perfect world, I think we would do exactly what Rory said. We would, we would do a cohort, and time would pass. We would do some work cross-sectionally, and in a few years, events would occur. But I think that for um, enthusiasm and political support, we couldn't do just that. So let's just say without knowing power, we would still probably put half of our investment in sequencing a cohort, an interesting cohort. But we'd take the other half and we would try to pick some diseases that would yield enthusiasm in the meantime. And for those, we would have to do power calculations and they would probably be wrong. But, but some of what you're hearing of, let's do some disease-specific work and let's do some general work, it's, I, think, I think we all recognize it is the, it's the NIH and we have disease-specific institutes and people also want to see, couldn't this work for a disease? Right. So I think you're getting a little tension between mm -hmm. let's, let's sequence a bunch of people, which is what we should do. Mm -hmm. But in addition, let's go after a couple of promising diseases. Does, mm -hmm. that, does that help a little bit with um, I think so. the spectrum yeah. of phenotypes point there? Mm -hmm. Chris? Just on the power calculations, is my, my point was just if we have data, it's relatively available or will be available in the next six to 12 months, why not use it? Um, because, I mean, Rory, in the clinical trials, uh, many of those trials that you, you led were based on power calculations, based on real trials that had been done previously. And they weren't always correct, but at least they were based on data as opposed to no data. And so that's, that's, that was the point. It may not be perfect data, but at least it's some data. Yes, do you? Yeah, I mean, I think this just brings us back to the point of thinking about pilots, plural, and, you know, we're going to look at different things. I, I, I would be really worried if we put all our eggs in one particular basket here, because I think mm -hmm. there are enough competing and very important competitive, you know, scientific hypotheses and ideas here, and the question is, how do we come up with a suitable hybrid uh, of, uh, of pilots. And so, you know, having the disease-specific issues and the modifiers and the EMRs and cohorts, we're, we're, I hope that we're looking at some kind of combination here, a mongrel set of uh, mm -hmm. pilots as opposed to just attempting one particular hypothesis. So I think uh, we had Peter and then Nancy. Or Peter, are you not? You have your microphone on. So. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Nancy. So uh, the, the other thing that I would bring up that we, we haven't gone back to is, I mean, it relates to something that, that Paul said, um, things that Peter mentioned in his talk, and, and that, that is, it seems that we also want to, in the pilots, um, set ourselves some goals that we know we can achieve, that is, either by way of choosing phenotypes or choosing things that we're going to look at, we will get an answer. So whether it's, how, you know, we will learn how dynamic the genome is because we will have samples that were collected from some cohorts over time and, and we will see how dynamic the genome is. Or if it's epigenomics, whatever it is, that, that we know we will get answers about and that, that there won't be people dissatisfied at the end that, mm. um, that we didn't discover anything new. Mm. We will formulate hypotheses or <coughs> goals that can be met in some of the early pilots so that, so that there's good, good um, consensus about going forward. I, I think that that might be important. There really is this pushback 
around genetics and genomics that, you know, I, I mean, if one of the goals was we are going to solve the genetic architecture of whatever it is, diabetes, obesity, um, I, that's probably not a goal for the pilots. Right. So, so one of the things we didn't talk about, we probably can't solve this afternoon, is, is what appropriate pilots would be. But it's, but it's probably something that we do want to address for, for the summation that, that comes out of this. And so I'd, I'd ask people to, to be thinking about that uh, in terms of what, what we might want to do or propose in terms of pilot studies. I think the, the you know, loud and clear message that we've gotten is not just a single pilot, uh, but it address multiple questions. Fair enough? Okay. All right. Um, so it didn't really um, uh, fiddle much with pharmacogenetics. We did hear a little bit um, in terms of long longitudinal change uh, in, in terms of in being sure that we include both disease progression and lack of response to proven therapies. I think Tricia came up with some good uh, examples of that. Uh, and, and, you know, an, an interesting question and one that we might want to address is how would we tailor, um, and remember these are the questions, these are not the answers, um, how would we tailor the age that is most appropriate for cancer screening? A very useful question and, and one that could be addressed in, in longitudinal data. Um, I just add one quick thing there that Please. In, in your progression there, the, one of the things would be multiple samplings. I think longitudinal changes means just not knowing on the phenotype. It would be very, very useful in at least, you know, to be able to look longitudinally at the genome itself since we know about mosaicism and, you know, epigenomic changes and the like, that, that that's at least something to consider that mm -hmm. would be embedded in that. Cool. Or the somatic genome, for yeah. sure. Yep. Okay, then um, health disparities, epigenetics, annotation of the genome, we you know, seem to, to be pretty much everybody agreed those were useful things. Surveying a large data resource, um, uh, Daniel came up with a couple of, of you know, nifty questions that I think are good examples of, of how we might use a resource. What are the, the missense variants in a gene of interest to a particular biologist? What are the phenotypes that are associated with those variants for a particular clinician? What are the variants in my patient's genome that are associated with disease? So those are, are you know, sort of useful uh, example questions that one could use with a large resource. There are many, many others. Um, we also asked the question, in, in what instances are genetics powerful for predicting undiagnosed diseases? I have um, uh, in what instances in, in parentheses because I think the person who asked this question actually said, are genetics powerful? Um, and I hate yes, no questions. So, so I think we're, you know, we would never assume the answer to this could possibly be no. So in, in, uh, in effect, we would say in what instances uh, or, or what would make them more powerful? Okay. So I, I don't think that we've exhausted the scientific questions. I don't know that we need to exhaust them. But when we get to this issue of crosswalking the criteria with the questions, we do need to identify those questions that need specific cohorts or specific kinds of sample co um, 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 collections that we ha haven't really been describing here. So, um, yeah, please. Let me ask Maynard a question. I believe it was the Abramson report. These pilots, did the pilots tend to be technical feasibility or were the pilots baby steps on these bigger, broader questions? Um, lar largely the model was to, I, th I think it's a mix of both of what you said. Uh, they were intended to stress but not break the technology available going into them. Uh, and so that kind of set their scale. Where they really differed from the way the NIH usually does business, and I think that the same tension is here now, uh, is that they, they were more uh, technology and infrastructure driven, the choice of them, uh, than scientific objective driven. Uh, so we were mostly talking about model organism sequencing, and uh, there was an initial sort of uh, hierarchy of genomes, uh, E. coli, yeast, uh, worms, and, uh, and human chromosomes. Didn't play out exactly in the planned order, but it, 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 it actually came fairly close. Uh, but the criteria were uh, very much, I think, in the sense that Rory was saying, uh, it, are, are we going to really know more about how to do this hard thing after we've done this pilot project, uh, as opposed to are we going to have learned uh, about worm development or learned about this or learned about that? <coughs> One thing I just would say, I, I'd say two things sort of listening to this. It, it, it's probably not what the, you know, what, 
one wants to hear at the, at the end of an exhausted uh, sort of workshop exercise. But uh, as a, really an essentially an outsider to this group, I, I don't think there is actually strong consensus uh, here about I think what right. we're trying to accomplish. Yes. And that if, if, if we try to fit the diverse views around the table into one kind of policy package, it, it's not going to be a very pretty one. Uh, just do keep in mind that this is the NIH. Mm -hmm. Life will go on. Uh, we have an uh, uncountable number of disease-specific institutes. There is no risk uh, over the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, that there will not be many projects funded by different institutes to study particular diseases and particular science-driven questions. Uh, I think what is more up in the air is will we actually make a major change in the discovery model, or perhaps we could look for other ways of phrasing that, but uh, this more long-term view that we're going to try to change the way we do business so that down the road, uh, the many different kinds of questions studied at the NIH will be studied differently than they are today. Uh, and that, that really takes a different mindset. It's where the NHGRA came from. This was not going to happen, I guarantee. I was there and I watched this dynamic and it was not going to happen uh, unless uh, very special mechanisms were set up uh, with a different way of setting goals and so forth. It can coexist. I mean, a small fraction, uh, only a small fraction of the money that went into DNA sequencing and related technologies was being spent through the, the old NC. GR and then the NHGRI, all through the, in, until the peak phase of the Human Genome Project. Lots of, you know, all the other institutes, they remain very active using these technologies as they saw fit. So I'm not suggesting forming a new institute, but I, I, I think that there is a fundamental tension here. That, there, uh, there is. And, and if we try to, try that, that it's best to recognize it and find mechanisms whereby the different major branches of... Uh -huh these interests can, can play out. Right, and, and I think it's, it is important to recognize we had multiple goals here. So, so one of the goals, actually the stated goal, was to, was to give it NIH institutes, which are many and diverse and many are represented here, advice on what to do with sequencing. Because as Trish said, people are coming up and say, sequence my cohort, here's why you should. So that, that was sort of one set of goals, and I think that's where we have the most diversity. Then there are, you know, some of the folks at that end of the table were saying, let's design, you know, a, a great big cohort for a whole variety of, of reasons and, a, and a, a large million person project. That's kind of another issue and, and one that we can address here, but we certainly aren't going to solve and we can't put the two of them together necessarily. Stephen, did you have a comment? Okay. Um, I, we did promise people if we gave up the break, we'd get you out by 445, so um, trying to, to do that. Um, these, again, you will see these questions again. You'll have the opportunity to comment and, and uh, you know, rip them apart and, and that sort of thing, but, but this was uh, sort of the start, at least. We did get a few process questions. One of the issues that came up is how can we reduce the signal-to-noise ratio in, in whole genome um, sequencing data and human disease? Um, what are different strategies we might need to use for population stratification in rare variants? Um, and the suggestion last evening was more specific reference populations. Uh, Rory had raised the issue of can we use the lessons learned from the GWAS era, and, and several people echoed this, um, especially from the multiple meta-analysis that basically smashed together, you know, all these exquisite, uh, uniquely phenotyped groups into, into one lowest common denominator, um, and what do we actually want in 10 to 15 years? And then there was also the question asked in terms of what data and biospecimens should prospective birth cohorts, for example, collect um, that might be most in informative for future research. This is an another one that, uh, that came to Eric. Uh, and I would, I would say for the purposes of this group, for sequencing studies. So something to consider in terms of process, prospective birth cohorts will continue to occur. Um, does sequencing change what they should be doing in terms of, of data collection? Okay. The criteria for selection we've we've talked about. Eric actually gave a gave a, a lovely summary, which I've put into just the first bullet here. So I think everybody was in agreement. We should have large. Uh, they should be large. There should be broad phenotyping. There should be longitudinal data. You know, all of these are desiderata. The ongoing contact, uh, uh, adequate consent for recontact. There should be diversity, um, and to the degree that we can, we should include isolated, consanguineous, or otherwise unusual populations. Um, there there was discussion about variable disease progression being part of longitudinal data. Um, 
Um, people should be sequenced who have EMR data available. That's not the only place one would look for phenotypes, but if you, if you have a choice between the two, it seems logical to try to use as, as much passive data collection as you can. Um, we, we did hear about it. It would be important in, in whatever groups we choose to have the capacity to go deep to phenotype. You don't have to start deep, but to have the capacity to go deep when it's needed, uh, recognizing that you can't be both deep and broad uh, initially. But as, as Rory mentioned, it would be good to have um, in, in the multiple disease outcomes to be able to go much deeper than we have in the past in assigning disease outcomes, and perhaps deeper than one might have initially gone in the phenotypes. Did I, I get that right, your point, correct, Rory? essentially. Um, we heard from Maynard that perhaps minimal pre-selection is needed, as we'll almost certainly need some follow-up phenotyping. So you could start with simple EMR or survey data. You, could, you might even be able to start with 23andMe data. Um, that's questionable. Uh, or or um, uh, questionnaires. We would like to link to family information or to robust concurrent family studies, and we'd like to be able to, uh, to have uh, other omic data. Does anybody disagree with any of these as, as things that we would like to have in large collections that we considered for sequencing? One of the things we didn't do was prioritize these. I think that's, yeah. That's, um, so one of the things we didn't do is prioritize these. I might suggest, just for the purposes of, of Friday afternoon, that these seem to be our highest priorities and these were lower priorities. Would people tend to agree with that? Yes. And I think we also you know, look at this list and say this is where we'd like to be, but I would want to be careful not to say that in order to start the discussion of any place you have to meet every, every one, one of these, these criteria yes, yes, because absolutely. there is a natural evolution to this process in both formulating what we do and the opportunity for people to go back and get other things. I mean, there's a huge investment, you know, of what, five or six million people in different cohorts across NIH where you have opportunities for these synthetic cohorts and opportunities to bring, you know, go find other phenotypes, so to speak, and, and people who are already enrolled in these large studies. So, um, you know, it, it shouldn't be a sine, no, sine qua non criteria that you have to meet all of these. It's right, can you right. do that over a period of time with yes. not too much of an expense gotcha. to get there. Okay. Evan. Yeah, I don't know where you drew the line with the light pan where the upper and lower bound were. Oh, I'm sorry. So the first bullet seemed to be, right. those were all of the things that Eric went over. Um, I, just before. I would just like to say the multiple disease outcomes one is a, could be a really important one. That is, if, if, if you're looking for mm -hmm. genes with pleiotropic effects that came earlier, in terms of looking for factors that influence risk or protection from multiple diseases, mm -hmm. uh, given especially the presence of, of, of multiple morbidity that uh, accumulates with advancing age, I don't know if it's number one, but I just think that's, that's a fairly high priority one that should not be forgotten. Okay. Would anyone disagree with, with that as being a high priority? Okay. Good. All right, then. Um, we're just about done, but we're not quite done. So we need to crosswalk the questions and the criteria. What we haven't really done is take some of those on a little bit more exotic criteria and link them back to some of the more exotic questions. We may not need family studies for, for you know, run-of-the-mill complex diseases. We will definitely need them for, you know, rarer diseases or, or other or the kinds of studies. So, so we need to try and do that, and Eric and I are going to give a shot at that and send it to you. Um, we need additional questions that may require different criteria. So, so if you come up with you know additional scientific questions that still fit the criteria that we've identified, you know that's interesting, but it's not as as important I think to our purposes as identifying um, additional questions that gee you really need a, a different set of criteria in order to be able to answer this particular question. Uh, we would like to place some priorities as we mentioned. Um, we will uh, draft a thousand commentaries, a thousand word commentary, um, and distribute it <laughs> very soon. That way we'll get the diversity of opinions. Um, we'd we'd like to aim for two week turnarounds on drafts, and our, our hope would be that all the participants and moderators uh, would be co-authors uh, to the degree that the, the journal that is, is lucky enough to get the submission from us um, it will permit. Uh, but we, you, know, you must respond on the drafts in order to be a co-author. So that's kind of the plan going forward. Okay, and it's now five, 444, at least by that clock, 444 and a half. So I, maybe I can, uh, at least for NHGRI, thank everybody for the you know, exquisite work that you've done and the time that you've spent on this. Thank you very much for sticking it out. Eric, any closing comments? Great. Great. Okay, thank you.